Thank you for joining the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security as we discuss pressing topics in the news, issues affecting professionals in our field, and exciting new projects and services. I'm Trudy Henson with the Center for Health and Homeland Security at the University of Maryland, and we're here to talk about the Zika virus outbreak, and joining us in the discussion is Dr. Lena Wynn from Baltimore City Health Department. She's the Baltimore City Health Commissioner. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here, Trudy. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about Zika virus, especially at the international level. Um, we've heard about the World Health Organization's emergency declaration, and the Olympics are happening in Brazil where mm -hmm. the outbreak is um, quite large. Um, but today we want to talk a little bit more about local response. and. Baltimore and in Maryland, um, Baltimore City specifically. And so it's officially spring now and it's summer and people are thinking about getting outside, but um, right. of course with Zika there's a lot of concern about mosquitoes. And so I guess my first question is, have there been any cases in Maryland of Zika and is this something people should be worried about? Absolutely. And let me just say first of all that this is a tricky issue to discuss okay. and also to work around. And the reason is that we want to be prepared. We know that there is no vaccine, there is no treatment for Zika, so the best preparation is vector control, is mosquito control. So we have to be prepared for spring and summer mm -hmm. because even though the mosquito that carries Zika isn't known to be in this area most of the time, mm -hmm. there's still the chance that another type of 80s mosquito that could carry Zika, that mosquito is in this area. So we have to be ready for spring and summer. So preparedness is important and getting funding for preparedness is important and getting our other agencies and making sure that we coordinate our efforts in, in, in advance is critical. But we have to balance that between people getting too nervous about Zika as well. <laughs> right. Right? We don't, I, I remember just, this was back a couple months ago when it was freezing cold, uh, cold, cold blue weather outside, going to one of our staff meetings. And our staff were saying, well, but they're terrified of getting Zika. And we don't want that to be the message either. So it's a fine balance between preparation mm -hmm. and being worried mm -hmm. and concerned so that we do the right things and between getting the accurate message out so that um, we have the proper precautions but are not spreading um, spreading rumors and being <laughs> too worried about Zika. Um, so, to, so to your point, there have been five cases so far okay. in Maryland. Um, there are all cases of individuals who are travelers who okay. acquired Zika as a result of traveling to other countries. And this is so far in the continental U.S., except for a case of sexual tra tra transmission, the cases have generally all been uh, travel associated and not locally acquired. And that's why our main message that we're sending out is, first of all, if you are pregnant, make sure that you look at the CDC website and talk to your doctor to see if you should still be traveling and if you should postpone travel to these countries. And also if you are a male partner mm -hmm. of a pregnant woman, that, and you have traveled to an to a, uh, to area with, with Zika transmission ongoing, that you should abstain from sex or use condoms every time for the duration of the pregnancy. So that's been our message, okay. but the coordination has been critical on our part. Absolutely. So kind of caution is the watchword, not, not, too, not too panic yet. <laughs> well, it's also knowing when you should be worried and which groups should be worried. Absolutely. If you're going on spring break, for example, we just did a lot of messaging around spring break. If you're going on spring break, including to many of these areas with <laughs> Zika transmission, mm -hmm. it's always a good idea to pack insect repellent, to wear long sleeves and long pants, to make sure that if you're sleeping outside that you have a bed net, if you're sleeping indoors to have screens or an air-conditioned room. I mean, these are all common sense precautions. People may forget them in the hype of, of, of traveling to fun places. But it's not only Zika, it's also chikungunya and dengue and West Nile and other, um, other diseases that are spread by, by, uh, by, by mosquitoes. So all the preparations that we have to take, but again, specific groups. If you're in Baltimore City at the moment, there is no chance of getting Zika right now from mosquitoes because it's still quite cold outside. But again, watching out for sexual transmission and especially for, for women who are pregnant who are thinking about travel, that's the group that we want to make sure that the messaging goes out to use your words to be cautious mm -hmm. and to be prepared. Okay. And um, what, what other preparations is Baltimore City Health Department doing for the Zika virus? Is there anything else? You, you talked a lot about messaging, but what else? 
what other preparations are in the works? Absolutely. Messaging is critical, again, to get out the right message for it to be clear and unambiguous. We saw last year with Ebola mm -hmm. and with the possible cases of measles here that if we don't get out the message, other people will. And we need for the message to be very clear, to be evidence-based, to always follow the guidelines by the, by, by, by the CDC, and especially for a situation like Zika that's quickly evolving and frankly quite confusing. I mean, we heard the, uh, the director of the CDC, for example, say that things are changing literally every day. We don't have a vaccine now, but several months from now, who knows? We um, were not aware of the huge risk of sexual transmission before as much as we are now. I mean, we don't know the full effect of Zika on the pregnant women and, and, on, the, and on the unborn child. I mean, these are all issues that, um, that, are, that are ongoing, and so the communication is critical. Another part is preparation and in particular, the coordination with other city and state agencies. Mm -hmm. Addressing Zika and preparing for Zika is not just a responsibility of the health department. We all have to be involved. We have all of our city agencies, including housing, including public works, a law department, labor commissioner, I mean, all, basically all the city agencies involved, city schools, social services, because we all need to play a role with the services that we provide. We can all play a role in public messaging, mm -hmm. for example, vacant lots and standing water. There's something we can all do about that and in getting the message out about what Zika is and how we can prepare for it. But we also have to coordinate interagency efforts around larvicide and pesticide and preparation and even thinking through, you mentioned Brazil earlier, mm -hmm. it's not only international travel. If Zika comes to Maryland, if it comes to Baltimore, what about our pregnant workers? What are the protections that are going to be afforded and how can we make sure that using the core principles of public health, we are investing upstream? that we are protecting our most vulnerable moms and babies and providing them with the protection that they need. And so these are all questions that we are addressing now and we strongly prepare, believe in preparing now rather than waiting for something to happen <laughs> to begin thinking about this. I mean, this is the core of preparedness and thankfully here at the health department, we are led <laughs> by our wonderful director of, um, of, of public health preparedness, Jennifer Martin, who is here with us in the studio today and is smiling at us now. <laughs> And so you mentioned a lot of partners helping you, but as far as preparations in the city, does that preparation and the messaging look a lot like it would in a suburban jurisdiction, or are there special concerns with the city population or a city on the water? Is that something that you take into account, or does that change the response? It's a very good question. I don't know the answer <laughs> about suburban versus urban or rural versus urban, and I'm not even sure that that's the most important distinction. Okay. The most important distinction to me is that Zika, like virtually all other diseases, is a disease of poverty. Okay. It's a disease that is going to be the most rampant and will have the worst effects in areas of high disparities and in areas of concentrated poverty, which unfortunately is our reality here in Baltimore City. We saw that in the case of Ebola. We've seen it for HIV. We've seen it for virtually every disease that Virtually every disease is a disease of poverty. And that's why we hope that there will be additional federal funding that's allocated in particular to areas like ours that already face such huge disparities, 20 year difference in life expectancy where many people in the city can expect to live to 65 years old, where we have one in three of our children who live below the federal poverty line, where 85% of our children are in low-income families and thousands of kids every day are homeless. I mean, we're in situations where we have high medical need, high health need as it is. And because we have high numbers of vacant lots, because we have many other issues, and because we are in a concentrated area near the water, as you said, but also in the south enough that we could have this other type of, of Aedes mosquito that could carry Zika, these are significant issues, and so the president has, um, has, uh, has asked Congress for appropriations for, to specifically address Zika, and we hope that Congress will, will allocate those, um, those funds to fight Zika, because frankly, we need it, and the cost downstream is going to be much more if we do, in fact, have hundreds or thousands of our children being born with significant brain damage. I mean, this is an issue of health equity, this is an issue of justice, and it's an issue of, of, of doing the right thing. Absolutely. Um, and you had mentioned before, 
particularly targeting pregnant women or maybe women who are thinking about becoming pregnant with your messaging. What other types of demographics are you targeting or is it is it specifically pregnant women or women thinking of becoming pregnant that you're concentrating on right now? Well, we know that Zika, for most people who get it, don't cause any symptoms at all. And that those who do get mild symptoms, including fever and rash and just other viral, mild, viral, a very mild viral syndrome. Yeah, I was reading that some people can have it and not know it, and that might be part of the difficulty in fighting it. Eighty percent. Eighty percent of people who get Zika, it's estimated, don't know that they have Zika because they don't have any symptoms. And even the ones who do, maybe they think that they have a mild virus of some sort, like a cold, and maybe that's why they're having a fever and itchy eyes and achy joints. And so the messaging for us is three categories. The first is people who are going to a country with Zika transmission ongoing. Then we want them to be watching out for signs and symptoms once they return. And certainly anyone who goes to really anywhere that they would like to go for spring break <laughs> should be wearing insect repellent and doing the other, um, the other things for, for mosquito control anyway. Second category, most important category is pregnant women. So we're concerned about pregnant women who are in the process of deciding whether to travel, mm -hmm. pregnant women who have returned from one of these countries, or in general, who, uh, who might be here over the summer and Zika could come over the summer. So certainly this is a category we're very concerned with. Third category is their, their male partners. Again, because of the, the possibility of sexual tra tra transmission. And these are men who could be going to other countries or could have could just been coming back from, from other countries too. So those are the three categories that we are most concerned with. Um, I will say that there's a fourth category that's the one with the least amount of information, but again, this is quickly evolving, and that's people who are thinking about becoming pregnant. Mm -hmm. Young women, um, their partners, that's a category where the guidance is constantly changing, and so the most important thing, visit the CDC website or talk to your doctor if you are in that, in, in, in that category and make an informed decision together. Okay, great. And then I think you kind of touched on this with what you said, common sense measures, bug spray, that kind of thing. But if you're concerned about Zika virus, what are some measures that you would recommend people implement to protect themselves? Absolutely. So the most important thing is vector control, which means that we have to stop the mosquito mm -hmm. in the first place. And we know the number one thing we can do to stop mosquito breeding literally in our backyard is to eliminate any standing water. And I don't just mean a large pool that's in a vacant property. I mean, that's very obviously a large body of standing water, but also containers, Tupperware containers, flower pots, um, all of these are, are potential reservoirs for, for Zika. So get rid of all of those things in your backyard, on your windowsill. That's the number one thing that we can all do. Other things we can do, absolutely insect repellent. Make sure that the insect repellent you're using has the EPA approval label on it. Okay. That's important for if you're here in Maryland or if you're going to be tra traveling abroad. Then wear long sleeves, long pants. Um, the Aedes mosquito is a very aggressive biter. Um, it, when possible, cover up and otherwise use insect repellent. And don't just use it once. <laughs> follow the instructions, especially if you're going to be swimming, if you're sweating a lot, follow the, the instructions as, as written. And then now is the time to check to see if you have uh, screens on all of your windows and doors. And if you don't, it's time to go and see if you can get the screens placed um, or to get air conditioning as well, because you do not want to be leaving your doors open and that, that's a way for, for, for mosquitoes to, to come in. Okay. Um, do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share with us before we go? Only that people don't think about preparedness and emergencies until things happen. Mm -hmm. We're now coming to a year post unrest. And the unrest wasn't something that we could have possibly predicted or really prepared for. I mean, we were prepared for it in the sense that we know how to prepare for, you know, prepare for emergencies. And mm -hmm. some have said, well, this is an issue that's been brewing for years, which is true. But what happened here, what happened in Ferguson could have happened in any other jurisdiction. And our response in the wake of the unrest shows to me how much public health is tasked to do. We had to get our most vulnerable patients to dialysis and chemotherapy to get the medications. And this is the job of health to protect our most vulnerable and we can do it. But that also means that now is the time to prepare. Now is the time to get ready. Don't wait until there is an emergency to prepare. I mean, this is common sense, I'm sure, to all of your viewers, but 
That also means, though, that I hope people other than individuals who are already invested in preparedness are watching this because we need funding. We need funding to not only address the end result, which is really important. I'm an ER doctor. I see what happens at the end result of trauma. Mm -hmm. But how much better would it be to prevent something bad from happening in the first place? And so for anyone who's watching, who is in charge <laughs> of funding in some way or wants to help us advocate for funding for preparedness, this is your chance to do that. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Um, and that will finish this discussion. But thank you for joining, and thank you for having part of this conversation.